Welcome back to Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis. We are here in the studio speaking with Simon Kingley side today. Yes, we were just talking about you're such a good actor in every way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how did you do it? I don't know. You can't expect me to give us talk about Oh, you old can, fourth back. Yes, you can talk about it. No, I did an, uh, an interview. Luckily, he was my friend. I was at university with him, and he was a great actor then. He is now like the, one of the great Shakespearean. Simon Russell Beale, he comes here. Uh, but we, he was doing Hamlet, which was jaw droppingly wonderful in London, around the same time as I was doing the, the opera. Cheesy opera. <laughs> no, it's, it's it, look, there's, there's, therein lies a point. Not every piece of art has to be the greatest thing ever sure. written. But if you do it with great commitment and intensity, it can be a fantastic evening. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. the houses like the Met and Covent Garden understand that. You put them on and you try and drive them hard and make them work. And I think we did. We did. Right. Anyway, I did the um, interview with uh, Russell Beale and they were asking me to talk about Hamlet. And uh -huh. I said, I'm not going to sit here and talk about Hamlet in front of Russell Beale. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards, <laughs> afterwards... Well, you might be, you know, have s your point of view. Yeah, I know, but you wouldn't sit one of, in front of one of the world's great Shakespearean actors of one of the great Hamlets and ta start spouting about what right. acting is, would right. you? Right. Particularly in the world where opera singers are considered second-class actors. <laughs> Whether they are or not is not the point. But he wrote to me after us because there was a review. Uh-huh. And it said the fat portly knight uh, from Simon Russell Beer, and it said the um, it said the intense bullshit, of course, but the intense and uh, uh, mysterious. Simon Kinsey, I didn't say anything. And Simon <laughs> Russell Beale wrote to me, and I can't use the f word on this. <laughs> he said, "You effing f f f." <laughs> <laughs> but I just didn't want to speak about acting in front of him. Which the, you know, uh, who's the guy who's just been doing Jerusalem here? Come on, he's one of my favourites. No uh, Mark Rylance. I can see him doing anything. It's fantastic. It's, you know, great acting is just so thrilling to watch. So, uh, what is your next move? My next move? How do you mean my next move? <laughs> oh, in life, <laughs> in your career, or to whatever. To hang on for dear life <laughs> by my fingernails on the window ledge mm -hmm. of what is laughingly known as my career. What what are some of the roles, opera roles, that you have not sung that you would say, oh, you know, before I hang it up, I'm going to do that one. I don't want to hang it up yet. I, oh, no, of I don't <laughs> eat breakfast all day, but I can't imagine living without breakfast. Same is true of singing. I, I, I don't want to stop. I won't stop. But what do you want to sing? What, I'm what singing you it. A, you're singing it, right? But in the last five years, I, I was very cautious and, uh, yeah, I, w I mean, it doesn't seem it now, but I'm very, because I'm relaxed with YouTube, I'm a very mm -hmm. shy man. I don't, a lot of people on the stage are extremely shy in real life. Right. So I, I was the combination meant that I didn't take on many things that I might have taken on five, six, ten years earlier. That's meant that I don't want to miss them out. And in the last five, eight years, I've embraced a whole raft of new roles, which has been quite exhausting. Rigoletto. <laughs> yeah, Rigoletto. Vozek. Beth, uh, Vozek, yeah. Von Jägen. I mean, that was a headache to learn. So I want to do those many, many, many times before the next one, which will be Ballo in January. Hmm. And then do that a few more, a lot of times, and then uh, Bocanegra. Bocanegra, mm. I was just thinking. And then it. I don't know. I'll we'll see. We'll see. There's one other, but I'm not going to own up to it on a film anyway. You but that's enough anyway. I think so. That's a lot of good. I'm stuff. not giving up. In fact, I've just taken on another revival of flute. I love it. It's a different accent. Right. It's very very tiring trying to fill a hall with dark with great amounts of text and speech in German for it's for four and a half thousand people or three thousand people and I love it and also I think uh, to mix it up so that you're not always exhausting yourself with the huge roles right. it makes for a healthier right. voice and that maybe would mean um, a longer time singing. Is there any particular opera that you feel is always exhaust you? I mean we're talking about could be four hours five hours but you know the music itself yeah, I think I believe very much being uh, with what Oscar Wilde said, uh, the definition of an artist is somebody who can hold diametrically opposite opinions at the same time. <laughs> so when I said to you at the beginning, opera is, uh, song is just as tiring. Well, it is in one way, but physically it's not. You know, right. to do Don Carlo or Macbeth in a big house is, for me, it's, it's just shattering. It's shattering for two, two couple of days afterwards 
Mm -hmm. I feel I got flu, you know. And you just take it easy and rest and learn how to rest. So, yeah. Um, and before the performance, you have a habit of, shall we say, disappearing. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need your time. You need your... Yeah, I do, Dennis, because I think it's perfectly natural. If I'm going to strain, stretch myself to the extremes, physically and vocally, it's nothing to do with getting as a character. That's a nonsense. Well, right. for me, it is anyway. Right. I just want to rest. And if, I, and if I'm going to use my voice for four hours in the evening, I think it's perfectly a fair deal to say to the voice, listen, OK, I'm going to rest you that day. So I'll be reasonably normal on a show day, but, you know, Bryn will laugh at me because he's just normal all the time. But I would like to just, just take it easy and go and watch TV or something. I don't, I want, don't want to talk much. And once you're at the theatre for the evening, yeah, you don't okay. want 20 people coming to you. No, that, that is oh, distracting yeah. then because I'm going through words and checking out, trying to think. This is going to sound pretentious, but it isn't. I'm trying to think of the arc of how I'm going to try and do the evening. I used to be a 400 meter runner in my 20s, and it was full time for me. And I only mention that not to, you know, for to be the big I am thing, but it's it was very similar to I find to the arc of a show. You know, when you you've got to be almost at full stretch in your abilities, but always relaxed, always a step back, but very involved, quite intense, but never quite. You know, it's and to get the arc right in the evening. It's very difficult. You go off too hard in a race or in an opera, and by the time you get to the third act, you'll be exhausted. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm before the show for an hour or so. I don't. I'd rather be on my own. Probably that's you know a very important is for you to have a so-called Zen moment. I mean, just a kind of quiet and try. I don't want it to sound pretentious. I don't know. I know you don't mean it that way, Bing. I, it's just about resting and yeah. marshalling mm -hmm. your resources. Right. I'm a strong man, but I'm, I'm, uh, I still need to still. be very careful. Sure. Do you have any pet peeves about the opera industry today? What is it, one big pet peeve that just bothers you? Well, I think that it's fair that if a director turns up for the beginning of a rehearsal period, that if I'm expected, as a, always perma permanently as a foreigner, to know my words and what they mean, I would, I would hope that directors would, and I'm afraid in the big wide world, Trying not to flare my nostrils to be irritated, but it's giving you away. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they would. We are living in an age of directors, and I wish them all the best, and I will give them my loyalty, but it's hard to give someone loyalty when they don't know what you're talking about. Mm. They don't need to speak. They can have the book. But uh, that's a big peeve, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going back to your early years of your career, you, you were at the Scottish Opera for yeah, several they, years. Yeah, actually, the, by default, I was in Hamburg before then, for a couple of years, and then I quit. But I was in the uh, in the big Hamburg calendars. It was a very important opera house. Still, it's a very, very important opera house, uh, state opera house. When they have the big splashy shows, they're in red in the middle of the poster. Mm -hmm. And they were doing Domingo was in, the, in his heyday doing Otello, and he was fantastic. And that was doing Montano, for like five words or something. But that meant I was in the middle, in the red bit. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing a recital in the basement, which was actually, in the end, it was supposed to be um, from Kudam to Broadway, which was like, uh, Kudam was like uh, cabaret in Berlin in the 30s. And I assumed when I'd just gone to Hamburg, not speaking German, I'd be in the Broadway bit. No, I was in somebody who's being mischievous, put me in the transvestite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a transvestite with oranges down my front, singing uh -huh. Berlin cabaret songs. But anyway, I was in the middle of this poster in red. And so when Scottish Opera were on the sort of talent hunt, they came and saw me, you know, in lights in the middle with Domingo. I wasn't doing anything, really. But they, they gave me a chance. That's so all you want as a singer, mm -hmm. a chance. And when you were there, you did a lot of roles and learned... <sighs> A lot in Scotland, right? Or well, yeah, I was freelance, and so it really depends. Oh, you were never fest. No, in I Scotland. was fest. Oh. You're, you're only really fest in the European houses. Mm -hmm. It's a great system, but it's a system designed for you to live there and be there for life. It's a great system. It means you live at home. But could choke you too. Well, if you don't want to live in that country or that culture, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, then it's, then it's hard. So I was freelance. So they gave me a chance, and, and you know, a young singer needs a break, and then. That's all you ask. Give me a chance. If it doesn't work, give me the money back. In this, in this, in essence, Scottish gave me a chance, and I, I think I must have taken it okay. And you know that's where it went, the way it went. 
And, the, you know, we're talking about houses. Now, is there any particular houses that you think is your favor or you feel oh, at home? Yes. I'm sorry, Bing, I didn't answer your question earlier about that. It's true. Uh, I don't want to be everywhere all the time. It's a Faustian pact, you know, be careful in this life what you wish for, whether it's opera singers or anything. Be careful what you wish for in case you get it. <laughs> yes. Mm, because then you have to live with the consequences. And it seems to be my turn now and has been for about 10 years. Then the hard thing is saying no, mm. you know? Someone said, well, will you do a new production of Salzburg of Don Carlo? Well, that's in the summer. That's the summer break gone. Right. Will you come and do X, Y, Z in all these fabulous houses? Now will you go to Japan and the, every man has his price and they'll send you a suit, you know, large sum of money? It's, you've got to stop and always take stock and think, what do I want out of this life? You, you know, also have a family right now. Yeah, well, I got married at 47 and my kids at 49 and 50. I so want to see them. Yeah. When Owen says to me today, Papa, they cut the me health. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to go see him now. How old is he, kid? Three. Three years yeah. old now. Wow. Mm. So, so I don't want to sing in every house, Bing. I'm still obliquely not quite answering your question. I have mm -hmm. a few yeah, yeah. houses that I'm very, very happy in, and I've some of it by default, some working hard at it. They would be the Met, which has came late to me, but um, New York is my favorite city. I love New York, and I love the Met, in spite of its size, I love it. Uh, Covent Garden, you know, I'm, my wife is a prima ballerina in the Royal Ballet, my children live there. It's not a country that, I, it's not, I don't consider myself English, British, my whole life has been on the road. I'm a probably a European. I'm probably a European. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, but I but anyway. So Covent Garden, um, Munich, definitely. Mm -hmm. Sometimes color. Zurich for the quality of life. It's a small house. One try stuff out. There's a lake just out there. You come out right. of the rehearsal, get right. into a rowing boat, and go into right. the lake, fall asleep in the sun, right. go in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Scala, I did years in Scala, but they planned too late. But it was with Ricardo Muti, so that's been very, very important mm -hmm. to me for about five years. Um, do you find it trade? Very, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's it. I, I don't want to go to uh -huh. everywhere. I, do, I, do, do you feel like it's very difficult to sing at the Met because it's such a huge house? Yeah, that's another good question, Bing. It, a great house, well, you need it in, in any house, you need a decent set. You know, we did a Macbeth, my first one in Vienna, and I failed. And I wanted to say to the audience, it's not my fault, ladies and gentlemen. You know, but you can't. You've got to take it on the chin. But the floor was made of rubs, four inches deep with rubber, and there was no walls and no back and no anything open. If you do that in the Met, if Bryn was doing the Siegfried like that in the Met, it would sink. He would fail, mm. even Bryn. Uh, so a great house also needs a production that is you know, what one man's definition of a good production is right. probably often not what a singer might say. Right. Uh, you need a set that's good enough for sound. It doesn't have to be a box. So the, the Met can be fantastic. The building is, the, the hall is very nice for sound. And if you've got somebody who's properly trained, and I'm afraid some modern set designers, uh, designers are not aware of these things, and it happens too often that we're given carpet on the floors, and uh, it's not good enough. Right, right. Um, but if you have a good set at the Met, you will have a fantastic chance for singers, not just to be heard, but I think what a singer must demand the right for to do is to colour, the right to sing piano, the right to sing dolce, and you need a set um, that what will help you. What was your debut at the Met? I forget. Well, it was the usual that the best bow in production there is. There uh -huh. is. There you go. You know, <laughs> I didn't great. do. It. I didn't do it very well, but no, I didn't. But uh, it's a gorgeous production. It is. When they were doing that one it's on Broadway. It's very good for sound, too. Yeah, yeah, it is. Why did you say you didn't do very well? Because that was the truth. I was anxious. And uh -huh. uh, the whole, you know, when you first come to the Met, you sure. stand there and think, what the? <laughs> <laughs> you don't see anything. <laughs> no, one of my colleagues, who's still here now, who's a, who's a, uh, singers often have uh, oscillations in their careers and their lives, and not, some of it is not all logical. 
When I was doing that bohème, there was a young baritone, American baritone, who was absolutely awesome. Yeah. Dwayne Croft, who was doing Barber. Oh, yeah, sure. And I remember watching Dwayne thinking, that's just fantastic singing. Mm. Yeah. So, um, anyway, you know, I, I've been a late developer in most things. And but you keep going back to Mozart, which is very... No, I don't keep going back to it. I keep mixing him in. Mixing him in, right. And you will in the future. I will always mix him in. And I will always mix in Botsek. And I will always mix in, you know, the fun of singing Don Carlo is the sing. He's a little bit of a dull creature, you must admit. Mm -hmm. And Peleas too. Well, I've finished with him now. One Dimension. A young man's view of the world is a little bit dull. Well, you know, Don it's Giovanni's, hysterical. Don Giovanni is not Don Giovanni, boring. well... There's a big distinction I, I notice between many of the Verdi characters and many of the Mozart ones. Mozart will give you a throw a whole pencil case of colors and say, go on, color it in as you want to. Verdi will go, that's your color. Ford, that's your color, red. You are a cuckold, you are furious. Or Don Carlo, you know, Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. Your color is yeah. this sort of, he's not the Schiller, the, um, the firebrand. He's it's more of Christianity and there's more of this sort of nobility and the vocal music line is that. Macbeth is more. Macbeth is very, very Mozartian, actually. Mm. But uh, Mozart is such fun to play. Let's, we have a clip from Don oh, Giovanni. No. This is a, Don't make me watch it. You have this to watch this because this <laughs> is a noise. particular color in Don Giovanni. <laughs> Julian, can we run the clip and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Oh, I can talk about something here. Which is very apposite. Get him off. <laughs> Get off. So, tell us about this, for that. talking into the telephone there. Yeah, well, uh, let's leave out just for a second, indulge me, dear listener. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always thought, uh, irrespective of any production, that the second verse of that was the only time you could see this man who was just so driven and had the privilege and the means to do anything on this mm -hmm. beautiful emerald spinning world, anything, and did, and got bored of it all. That there was one place, which was the second verse of this, where as if he had a glass forehead, you could, you could see into him. So, and actually, that's what I was talking about, color earlier, mm -hmm. that I wanted to take a color, which suddenly stopped this uh, vulpine f f um, attitude to, to the whole world. What can, I, what can I get out of it? And you saw this lonely man, empty. But I had occasion, I've got to tell you this, uh, a week ago, to see the original manuscripts. I was taken by the BBC to Paris, mm. and they brought the original Mozart manuscript. And because we singers have to learn these uh, the critical editions and commit them to memory, any discrepancy between the critical edition and the manuscript shines out as if it was underlined in yellow. And in this bit you just played, by chance, was one such thing. In the manuscript, he, I don't want to be too dry in this, because otherwise uh, they'll all fall off their seats. Più che il miele, more than honey. In the manuscripts, più del mele. Well, yeah, più del mele. Never mind the kale, but uh, the article. But, but mele, of course, was the old word for honey. But Mozart and Da Ponte are stuffed, 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 stuffed with double, triple, quadruple entendres. You can't play them all up because you, you look an idiot. But they're there. Mm -hmm. And in this particular instance, mele is also apples. So he's talking about our breasts as well. Ah. So he is not empty and lonely at this point. Not if you look at the manuscript. If he's still joking with her with a twinkle saying, you know, talking about her small pert breasts, he is still on the hunt. 
So that's a distinction. Well, that color, of the, the that color has, <laughs> in my head, that's changed. I can't do it that way anymore because I know that my master didn't write that. Is there any difference, just, you know, um, play or singing in the classic and the modern? <laughs> yeah, Bing, that's a lovely subject. Any, if we, as audiences, or we as on the stage get hung up on powdered wigs and costumes. Oh, is Mozart so lovely? Oh, marvellous, dear, isn't it? Oh, lovely. We have missed the point. These are radical works of art. Cultures change. Fashions change. Human nature never changes. No, these things are, these issues are about human nature, the nature of power, and particularly, since you're talking about Mozart, about freedom. All different freedoms. Cosi right. Fantuti, by the way, women and men are the same. In Marriage of Figaro, the, the abuse of uh, power and the distinction between peasant class and rich mm -hmm. class, that's taken, you know, really ratcheted up the, the, the pressure in Don Giovanni to see a real extreme of that. And then the great, great freedom of all, the greatest freedom of all in ma Magic Flute, the freedom to be that which you want to be, but not at anyone's, exp as anyone's expense. If we get stuck on powdered wigs, and then we have failed as actors, and we've also failed in the audiences with no leap of imagination to just think what these pieces are about. That they're completely re as relevant today. Of course as they, they are, because then. human nature hasn't changed yeah, any. Yeah, hasn't changed, right. No, and, and are we still discussing issues of freedom? Ladies and gentlemen, I would beg to say that we still are. Hmm. Yeah. You know, actually, you, you look back at all the history, the same subject same emotions mm. still over and over again yeah now we're talking about this is it in your career entire career is there any given moment that you feel that moment you will never forget is it such a yeah being there is <clears throat> there are many occasions mm -hmm. and i would say mostly because my good fortune has come late enough for me to realize that m m some people when they're younger are just more clued up than i was more together than I was. Uh, how can I put it? So that you can almost, in your head, look to the right, look to the left, see, see perspective. And so all these wonderful things that are happening to me, you know, Peleas with a Berlin Phil, at the time, just pinching myself metaphorically, saying, don't forget, this is your last one. Don't forget this. Mm -hmm. In the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's, I would say, happens again and again. Fotsek in Paris, which you taught me, Dennis, bless you. Mm, many, many things, actually. Yeah. Yeah. On a lighter side, are you a suspicious person, <laughs> or superstitious, superstitious, and do you have to like have a silver dollar in your pocket for a Do you have any little quirks like this? What do you think? I think you do. <laughs> you think I do? Of course you no, do. No, I don't think so. What are you so. telling me for, Dennis? <laughs> no, of course I don't. Nothing. Superstitious stuff, no. But you've got to be careful in different cultures, again. That's right. You've got to be careful. The whole point, we know this, of course, it's obvious. The whistling on stage thing was because they used to have extras moving the scenery, mm. and they were sailors, and the sailors moved the scenery based on whistles that they'd used on ships. There's nothing superstitious about that. Right. And yet, if you in Austria or Germany, Salzburg, you're whistling, you will deeply offend some people. Oh. So there's no point in offending anyone. So, so you don't, any color you don't wear. Where? No, you no. Wear well, is it purple in Italy? Purple in, Italy. Purple in, <laughs> in, in, in Vienna, you can't wear your hat across the stage. You can't really? wear your outdoor coat inside. Oh, or, uh, no, can't say Macbeth, all that stuff. On oh, that, that note, note. <laughs> well, I'm afraid we're out of time, and it's been a you know, great, great pleasure having you here. Pleasure's today. been all mine. Thank you so much, Simon. Cheers, both We've of you. We've been here on uh, Classic Talk with Bing and Dennis.